Uh, Kevin Lynch will be leading off, uh, the former Clerk of the Privy Council, Deputy Minister of Finance, Deputy Minister of Industry, currently the uh, Vice Chair of BMO um, Capital Markets, and we'll be now talking about um, innovation for larger companies, for established companies, which uh, is a very important part of the agenda of understanding innovation. Uh, as Tom said this morning, uh, the startup culture and getting new companies and that kind of uh, fizz in the economy is very important, but uh, our large companies are where, uh, where a lot of the action and a lot of the export action uh, exists as well, and, uh, and uh, they need to constantly be innovating as well. So that is what we're going to be talking about next, and uh, I'm looking for Kevin, who is uh, probably raising his hand somewhere in the doorway. He's blocked by Bill Morneau. I don't know what that actually means, but uh, <laughs> I will stall. Kevin? There we are. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Lynch. Thank you very much, Ed, for that introduction. And I think this is going to be a really exciting kind of panel looking at innovation, but innovation from the perspective not of startups, uh, which you talked about previously, but actually innovation in established, medium, and large uh, kind of firms and going through it. My sense is that there are really four basic questions that we need to ask ourselves when we think about uh, the relationship between innovation and business and how we can actually make that relationship closer. The first question is, why is innovation so important? The second is, what's the state of innovation in Canada today? Third is, where is innovation policy heading under the government? And fourth is, how can business work more effectively with universities, with um, uh, other private sector, and with government to actually do a better job on it? So just quickly through the four, the first one is, why is innovation important? You heard that this morning. Canada has a growth problem. We're stuck at under 2% growth, uh, and we've been used to 3% growth over the last 30 odd years, and that's going to have enormous impacts on our ability for public infrastructure, pensions, health care, you name it, as well as our standards of living and our uh, competitiveness. And really, in a high cost, high wage economy, the only way you can fundamentally change um, our growth path and our productivity is through innovation in both uh, established firms and in startups. The answer to the um, what's the state of innovation in Canada, if we wanted to be honest, is it's not so good, despite pockets of excellence. And in many ways, we have the pockets of excellence here on, on the, in the panel today, but the average numbers aren't so great. If you take business spending on um, R&D in Canada, it's under 1% and declining. If you look at Canada's kind of ranking on spending across OECD countries on R&D in the private sector, we're 26th. If you look at our ranking on innovation, according to the World Economic Forum, we're in the low 20s. If you look at our ranking on productivity growth over the last 25 years, we're 26. It's not a great uh, track record. So on average, we've got a lot of work to do. And one way to think of what that means in kind of personal terms is that we now have a productivity and a per capita income gap relative to the United States. Our productivity is about 70% of the US and that translates into a, an income gap of about $11,500 per Canadian. And that is what an innovation um, approach can do differently. The answer about where does um, innovation and innovation policy stand, the answer right now is consultations. The government has got three major exercises underway. Minister Baines, and you heard from him this morning, is looking at six pillars of innovation. Um, the Growth uh, Council, which Suzanne is a member, is looking at a number of areas uh, of how to rebuild Canadian growth, of which innovation is one of those areas. And the Minister of Finance, who you just heard from, also just launched his pre-budget consultations, and innovation is one of the issues that he's looking at. So you've got a lot of consultations underway. I think the challenge is going to be for the government and for uh, private sector and others working with the government is, how do you take all those ideas, how do you take all those consultations and turn them into a focused, integrated, targeted set of measures with a clear and compelling narrative and actually timelines that will make a difference 
and bring that together in, in the period ahead. And I think that's going to be the challenge, but also the potential uh, success. And lastly, the answer to the how question, in many ways, is what those consultations are trying to do. How do we improve innovation in Canada? How do we kind of have the average business behave like the businesses that we have on the panel here today? How do we bring the average up to the best and actually the best to the global best? So before we turn to the panel, let me just give you four or five thoughts to, to broadly guide the discussion and perhaps some of the panelists will turn to it. First is that innovation is not uh, about developing new technologies. That's the role of kind of research. Innovation is fundamentally about solving problems. It actually tries to put problem identifiers together with problem solvers, and that's the genius of innovation. And the better that firms are at doing that inside the firms, or the better ecosystems are at bringing those problem identifiers and problem solvers together, the more successful we can be. And I think that we, we have a lot to learn from experiences elsewhere in how to bring those identifiers and kind of solvers uh, together to do a better job. The second is that the innovation challenge, we tend to talk about innovation as if it's homogeneous in the challenge, but it's a very different challenge, as you heard in the previous panel, for startups than it is for established companies. And if we don't distinguish between the challenges that startups have in innovation and the challenges that established firms have in innovation, we're not going to get the solutions right. And so both have somewhat unique sets of circumstances that we need kind of work on, and they do as well. And so how do we deal with those? The third issue is investing in R&D and innovation in the pursuit of growth and competitiveness requires a couple of things. One, it requires risk-taking by firms, smart risk-taking. Firms have to be willing to invest in research and development, in the talent, in the, um, uh, in the capital. Secondly, it takes talent management in the firms that are actually capable and willing to do that. And thirdly, it takes capital markets to support those business strategies or else firms won't do it. And I guess the question we should ask ourselves is, do we have, on average, those conditions in most of Canadian businesses? And if not, how can we build them? How can we make them look like the companies on the stage here? My worry is that in a world of rampant short-termism, innovation spending may appear needlessly risky compared to cutting costs and share buybacks. But in a world of rampant and disruptive change, not investing in innovation may be the biggest risk a company takes. And again, how do we find that balance would be interesting to hear. Fourth, and Suzanne has talked about this a lot, is that how do we build, and it's easy to say, hard to do, strategic partnerships between the research and the incredible research capacity we have in our universities, the startup capacity, some brilliant firms, and you've heard from them, you know, in our ecosystems and established business. And you know, we're not going to do as well if there are three solitudes as we are if we can bring them together. So hopefully part of what the panel will talk about is how we can do that. I, I'm very impressed by some of those partnerships between startups and established firms that you see in the Toronto Waterloo Corridor. Steve and General Motors of Canada are doing that. Uh, Google Canada is doing the same thing. I'm sure there are other examples elsewhere. But we can't, we can't have that as the exception. We've got to have that as the rule. And fifth, I think we should be really careful not to um, confuse direction and pace. You know, we can be going at the right, in the right direction in terms of innovation, innovation policy, getting more innovation happening in business. But if we're not going at the right pace, it's not going to be a particularly successful journey. And the right pace is set by our most successful competitors. And so what we've got to do in Canada, I think, is going from being relatively good at innovation in business to being globally best we're going to have to do that in a time frame that's set by our best global competitor, not on Canada time. So with those thoughts, let me turn it over to Suzanne and engage the panel. Thank you. Merci, merci Kevin d'avoir lancé notre panel sur de très belles observations, des observations très importantes et pertinentes. As uh, you know, we're going to be talking about innovation in established companies. And I will start uh, by introducing this uh, fantastic panel. 
that we have with us. So uh, next to me is Lorraine Mitchell Moore, who uh, was a former president of Shell Canada and a founder of Smart Prosperity. Uh, next to Lorraine is Alain Belmar, president and CEO of Bombardier, uh, followed by Elaine Campbell, who's the interim president of Innovative Medicines Canada, and at the end, uh, Stephen Carlyle, who is the president and managing director of GM Canada. So a great group of people to talk about this topic. Je vais commencer par mettre la table, comme on dit en français, ou en anglais, to set the table. Uh, this morning, Tom Jenkins started the day by telling us that big companies are important. And I would add to that that innovation in big companies is incredibly important. Uh, innovation for big companies is what they need to constantly and continuously reinvent themselves so that they stay as global great or maybe global best in an environment that is fiercely competitive and in an environment that we describe with words uh, such as the ones we used this morning. Uh, disruptive, uh, we talked about also sustainability, of course, slow growth and the need for inclusive growth, and of course, talent. The word that wasn't mentioned this morning is war, in the sense of war for talent, although I know that we all feel that we're in an incredibly competitive environment globally when it comes to recruiting talent. So this is the challenge that they have. And uh, I will start by uh, asking each one of them to speak for about five minutes. And then I will ask them a few questions and turn to you, the audience, to ask them questions. And the first question that I will ask all of them, and they'll address the, uh, this question in turn, is how innovation looks in their own sector. Because as you know, they come from very different sectors, from the aeronautical to medicine, uh, oil and gas, automotive sector. So they're seeing innovation from their own perspective. And I think it would be great for all of us to hear about how innovation looks like in their sector and what they do to stay on top. Uh, I'll start by asking the question to Elaine because she comes from a um, sector that has innovation in its DNA, I would say. So we'll start with you, Elaine. Thank you, Suzanne. So uh, we're delighted to be here, and, and I'm delighted to represent the innovative uh, pharmaceutical industry in Canada. And uh, innovation is indeed in our DNA. Uh, without a continuous stream of uh, new product development, new medicines uh, coming to markets around the world, we would cease to exist as an industry. Um, we are also an industry that hires and, uh, and, and maintains uh, force, workforces that are highly educated. Of our 17,000 uh, employees in Canada, most have a science or an advanced science degree. And these are, these are solid, high-paying jobs and are, are uh, good contributors to the economy. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the innovations that have happened in our industry in the past uh, 20 years, actually, and they continue today. And I think one of the most important ones is the change in R&D direction. And if we think back 20 or 30 years ago, almost all of our companies had uh, multiple laboratories, with tens of thousands of researchers in uh, buildings around the world. And uh, not too many years ago, uh, we realized that the, our ability to innovate in-house was extremely limited, uh, a lot of the not invented here syndrome going on, and that the innovation that was incurring in academic institutions and in laboratories around the world, tens of thousands of laboratories, not, not researchers, but laboratories, we're starting to generate real breakthroughs in the area of specialized medicines, in the area of uh, precision medicine, and, and what we call personalized medicine, all of those areas. Uh, and so the industry uh, took on a huge shift, uh, recognizing first that incremental innovation in known areas of medicine was not welcome 
uh, by either patients or payers in the systems, mm -hmm. and also recognizing that to really get on to the next track, the really incredible development of medicines that make life-saving differences would take much more than the innovation that was in-house. And so today, we have far few of those bricks and mortar uh, uh, organizations and many dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of collaborative agreements with academic institutions around the world. We also use uh, collaborative mechanisms and we are using more technology all the way from the discovery of, uh, of new molecules through the development of uh, clinical platforms and testing. And finally, technology in the delivery and, uh, and recognizing when our medicines are working best and for who they work best. And this is an area that is accelerating very rapidly in all parts of the world, including here in Canada. I then, I think the best uh, talk about policy, where we could go in, in areas of policy that would be supportive of this, this new shift in the industry uh, and an accelerating shift. You know, in the, in the past, uh, the industry has enjoyed util utilization of shred credits, as have many others. And in reality, this is no longer uh, potentially the best mechanism to encourage an increase in investment. Shred uh, should probably be directed more towards emerging small and, and medium-sized entities. Our large organizations, where we do use tax credits, there are actually more generous tax uh, regimes in other parts of the world, and that is where the industry would, would put our efforts. So if, if R&D tax credits are going to be a policy instrument, uh, Canada has fallen a little bit behind there, and we don't utilize them uh, exclusively across our industries. So we could direct them to places they could be more effective and find other policy shifts that would be useful to our industry. I think a, an important area of innovation for us is health system delivery. We would welcome and wish to be part of an increasing and accelerating uh, implementation of technology and data to understand where, again, health system uh, delivery, health care is being done best and most efficiently. And finally, in the regulatory process area, the rest of the world is innovating in terms of their regulatory process. There is renewal. There is refresh in whether it's the FDA or the European regulatory associations. And, and Canada could speed up and take on a renewal process at a much more rapid rate in order to enable these new medicines, these new technologies, and these new ideas to come to market more quickly. Thank you. Merci, Hélène. I'll turn to Alain. Alain, your company has been the top Canadian company for investment in R&D for three years in a row. And you've done that while traveling through pretty turbulent skies. So we want to hear uh, from you about the path that you're on as, as a global company. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. I don't know what you mean by turbulent times. I mean, I haven't seen it. I said but, skies. Uh, <laughs> I said skies. <laughs> skies. <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here. I mean, as, as you just said, I mean, Bombardier has been a significant investor in uh, R&D. Um, we spend roughly between a billion to two billion dollars a year. In the past five years, we spend close to ten billion dollars developing new advanced uh, platforms uh, for the future, which has put tremendous pressure on uh, on the business. And I was it was very interesting to hear about uh, Kevin uh, mentioning that innovation doesn't come without risk, and uh, we feel it, mm -hmm. uh, and and we see that in action. Uh, if you look at where we are today, uh, we have uh, invested in, in commercial new platforms and business aircraft. Um, you, it's well known the C-Series is the best aircraft out there in the 100 to 150 seat class. Mm -hmm. And it's best not just from an operating cost standpoint where we bring the cost down by 20%, which is significant for our airline customers, but also that we don't talk much about it's the most environmental, environmental friendly aircraft out there. Uh, from a noise standpoint, it's 75% reduction noise footprint, which means that you basically contain the noise on takeoff within the, uh, the airport. Um, we have 20% less carbon emission, 50% less NOx. Uh, we have uh, received just an environmental product certificate, which is very unique in our industry. Um, think about that. One new C-Series out there is the equivalent of taking 30, 30, 32,000 cars 
out of the road for one year. Mm -hmm. That's what one C-Series bring to the market. So it's significant. So that is what we've done, and that, is, that has come with some pain. Uh, I think that we're, we're past that now, so we've, we're regaining momentum in the marketplace, but it, it was pretty challenging. So I mean, the notion of innovation and taking risk, investing, making a commitment, having the long-term vision and sticking to it, I mean, it's, that's what we do at Bombardier. On the, we are now uh, turning our efforts to develop the best business aircraft in the world. Uh, this is major innovation again. It's going to be the longest range, highest speed, uh, most comfortable business aircraft. I mean, flying at 50,000 feet at the, almost the speed of sound. I mean, this is very impressive. Why am I saying all of this? Is because in the end, all this engineering work is done right here in Canada. 100% hmm. of it right here in Canada. And you hear a lot about Bombardier's financial performance, our debt level, and the pressure that we are seeing. But the fact is, for the past like five to seven years, we have been investing massively in new products so that we can continue to compete for the long term in a very competitive environment. Innovation is not an option. Innovation is absolutely critical in aviation and as well in our train business. We have emerging competitors. We have the strong established players in aviation that are well known, the Boeing and the Airbus of this world, Embraer. But you have new players like China with a huge indigenous market supporting them. You have the Japanese investing massively. You have the Russian uh, coming back in, in the game with major investment. And on the train side, uh, although we have a leadership position today when it comes to technology and market access, but the fact is we're seeing the Chinese uh, becoming a significant player outside of the Chinese market. So we live innovation day in and day out. Uh, we are very fortunate to have such a large aerospace industry in Canada. Um, we feel, I feel very proud to lead Bombardier, which is the aerospace anchor here in, uh, in Canada. We have like 23,000 people just in Canada. We have 65,000 people around the world. We have 6,000 engineers working at Bombardier. So we, we, one of the things that we do have in Canada that is very, very good is talent. And I like to tell my team that in a nutshell, what we do in Canada is we use brain power to develop very advanced platform, high, techno high te technology products. We export them, because our market is relatively small, so we export 90% of the products outside of Canada. We bring fresh cash into the country, and in return, we create you know, high paying jobs. That's what we do. So, and that's what we need to keep doing and doing more moving forward. And I'll just finish on this. Uh, whether you talked about train or aerospace, these are like two different segments of the market. But, you know, when I was reading the material, you know, like it was, the panel was one of mature, mature companies. Yeah. And I noticed that you've, you've said established yes. companies. I feel better because mature sound pretty old to me. <laughs> <laughs> And if there's one thing in, in both of our market segments, aerospace and train, we are established. Yeah. But we're anything but old. Mm -hmm. I mean, we keep reinventing ourselves day in and day out, all the time, nonstop. And that's the only way that we can successfully compete in the long term. I think that we've done, we're very fortunate to have such a large aerospace industry in Canada, over 200,000 200, people are working in this industry. We need to find ways to appreciate what we have built together as, as a country and find mechanism to keep nurturing it and sustaining the growth in, in, in businesses that although establish a very strong growth on aerospace, you have 5% passenger traffic growth year over year, and that is true for the past 20 years, and that's the forecast for the next 10 years. The train side, solid growth, you know, that's going to be 
2x, 3x GDP, depending where GDP is. And, and the train business is an amazing business. I mean, it's, it's almost recession proof. I mean, that's a business where, I mean, when things are going well, people invest. And when things are not going well, government invests. So, I mean, it's, it's a good business. So I'll stop there and I'll let my colleagues yeah. talk. But I think that um, I'm very passionate about innovation and, and it's right smack core in what we do at Bombardier. Thank you, merci Alain. And you're right about uh, being a bit worried about the word mature because mature may convey a sense of, and I'm looking for Kevin here, complacency, which is probably the killer of, of uh, companies. And so uh, that's not at all what you are. You're established and you constantly have to reestablish yourself as a great uh, company in the world. I'll turn to Lorraine. Uh, you were here this morning and hearing about some of the great achievements in your sector. Uh, the SAGD uh, was mentioned by, I think it was Chris Reagan who mentioned that great technologies. You've had a lot of R&D in, in your sector and also some, uh, I would say, uh, challenges that have inspired more R&D in uh, trying to build a more sustainable industry. So I'll turn to you. Yeah. I. Uh Talking about innovation and disruption, I think our energy industry globally is uh, being disrupted. And uh, certainly with uh, the challenge, I think we have a surplus of uh, supply globally. And uh, when I look at uh, this industry, we have to compete for capital globally. And of course, when the cost went down, uh, price went down, capital uh, flowed out pretty fast uh, from Canada. And this is our engine of our economy. And so I think it was a real uh, awakening call to the fact that we have to compete with other sources of energy supply globally mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully a stimulus uh, for more innovation. And, uh, and I think our industry is going through where we have to now deliver a product that is cleaner, cleanest, I would say, and, and the cheapest. Uh, uh, around the globe. So we are competing for these others, uh, other uh, sort, uh, capital. I think the other thing that's really happened in our industry, and you just mentioned it, is uh, about sustainability. And uh, there's been a profound change in communications. And when I say communications, I mean the internet and the ability to create a movement mm -hmm. just so fast and can undermine your whole industry. And that is what we've experienced right here in Canada. So we have a major disruption, I think, happening in our industry, not only because we've been the marginal supplier, but also uh, because of the environmental challenge and the internet and the, uh, the uh, global attention that's been brought to the oil sands. So with that, I think that is a huge challenge. But with any challenge, innovation yeah. is all about how do you reframe a challenge yeah. into an opportunity. And I think this industry, with the price, what's happened, uh, with what's happening globally, with our market access, I think the industry has gotten ready for this challenge. And we've reframed it, I think, into uh, an incredible opportunity to compete globally to be the cleanest and the cheapest uh, resource. And uh, there's been a number of things that I think our industry has done uh, over the uh, last many years and uh, one of the, uh, at first it's about technology, some parts of technology, like you say, SAG-D, but I think it's moving from a SAG-D uh, to uh, using, instead of steam, using yeah. solvent technology. I think we're just starting with mm -hmm. that, that's coming. Uh, and uh, that will actually help on the environmental side and on the cost side. And I think the other thing that uh, my previous company, Shell, uh, took part in is uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Yes. And we see other companies starting to work at that now. And that's just the beginning, I think, of really dealing with the environmental challenge. And uh, what you're seeing, I think, that's most innovative besides technology, which we've done well over many years, is innovation in how we work with our partners. Mm -hmm. I think uh, COSIA, which is a Canadian oil sands innovation alliance, uh, was formed about uh, three year, four years ago with 13 companies just sharing all of their technologies uh, for basically for one sole purpose was to accelerate environmental performance. 
And that I have not seen in any other industry uh, globally, uh, in, uh, certainly in the oil industry. And uh, I think with our latest, with uh, the Alberta climate change policy, is to uh, what we've done there by partnering with government, partnering with environmentalists, and actually creating a cap on emissions. And again, that was very innovative in reframing the problem from one of no fossil fuels to fossil fuels is a tool. Instead, what are we really talking about? We're talking about emissions. Yeah. And so we actually put forward, we would cap emissions, which would mean that we would develop technologies that would still allow us to grow, but we would cap emissions. So on, that is the only jurisdiction in the world that actually has a cap on emissions in the oil industry. And so I think there's all kinds of innovation with collaboration. And, uh, and I think we've, we've got to get the, the cleaner. And the other part of innovation that I think is to come is working with First Nations. And Roberta talked about mm -hmm. it this morning. First Nations want, a be, want to be a part of our uh, resource industry. And, uh, and I, I feel that it's only a part of it in pockets. I think the future uh, that we need to work much more closely with First Nations, and we talked this morning about uh, being a part of the global supply chain. I think the industry works very well with First Nations in creating businesses. I would like to see much more innovation around creating businesses that actually also uh, create companies, because we, we've got very large international companies working in uh, the oil industry. And if they become part of uh, the global supply chain within these companies, I think is an incredible opportunity uh, for First Nations. So I think we've got a lot of innovation on the technology side, and I think there's a lot more innovation as well on collaboration and working with unlikely partners. And the key for us is uh, we will remain disrupted if we actually don't get market yes. access. And uh, so I think as a country, we need to start thinking about how, we, we talk a lot about clean tech. Clean tech is an enabler across all of the industries. We need to be talking more about what is our foundational, uh, as John put it this morning, our family business, and how do we take that family business and transition the family business of natural resources from a local, I would say, yes. continental player that is a supplier to a global player that is the most competitive in both the environmental side and cost side. And we need market access to be, even be able to play the game. And then we need to start thinking about how do we bring in First Nations? How do we transform our regulatory system? Mm -hmm. All of these to actually start thinking about how we innovate this family business. And uh, as Elaine put it, reinvent the business again. And, and I believe fundamentally mm -hmm that we have all the skills to be able to do that. But we do need uh, a Canada that's on board with that. Yes, yeah. And what you're seeing in your own sector applies to other parts of the natural resource sector. Absolutely. Forestry and mining and stuff. It's, more, it's more the foundation generally. of yeah. Canada. And I think we mm -hmm. sometimes, as Amanda Lang was just talking about, mm -hmm. you know, infrastructure isn't sexy. Well, the. the you know, our business is, is a foundation of <laughs> so, supplying something globally, and, uh, and, and we need to feel really proud mm. that we were actually blessed with the abundance of yeah. these resources. Yeah. I mean, in any natural resources, we're top five in the world. Yeah. Like, and then what you can do is apply technologies yeah. to actually export these technologies to other countries. Yeah. So it's an yeah. incredible opportunity. It is. I'll turn to Stephen. He's in a very exciting time in his own sector as we're talking about self-driving cars, cars that will become offices that will engage in video conference and whatnot uh, while the car drives itself and picks us up at the end of the day. It's just uh, uh, no longer the stuff of uh, of uh, science fiction, but mm -hmm. reality around the corner. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about, are you seeing this future? Yeah, well, off the top, I'd say the change in the auto industry is being driven by two major trends. And one of those is urbanization, meaning that globally, more and more people, you know, the vast preponderance of people in the world 
now live in large cities and uh, that leads to concerns about congestion and environment and uh, and that sort of thing and uh, if we couple that with the fact that we have um, new challengers coming into the auto industry into the mobility we start to think of it more as personal mobility than selling yeah. cars and trucks and because uh, what people are really looking for is safer more convenient ways to get from point A to point B and back again uh, that are good for the planet. And um, so that's what's really driving the, uh, the industry and that leads our CEO to say, um, our goal is to disrupt ourselves and to own the customer relationship uh, beyond the car. And it's a very purposeful um, charge. And the reason for it is uh, disrupt ourselves, meaning that there are other people coming in. And what I've learned over the years is if people are as or more interested in your space than you are, then you're probably missing something. So yeah. when we see uh, people like Google and Apple and Uber and the like of that start to get very interested in the auto industry for reasons we don't quite understand, we really need to redouble our efforts and, and understand that. And then the idea of owning the customer relationship beyond the car, that refers to this phenomenon of connectedness where yeah. the car very quickly in a matter of only a few years has become you know, the next device on the internet of things, so to speak. So, you know, we sum it up by saying we see a, a personal mobility system of the future that's uh, connected, it's uh, shared, it's autonomous, and it's increasingly, elec uh, increasingly electric. And so if we start to uh, uh, break that down, um, electric is really kind of an end goal in this whole subject of decarbonizing transportation. So our industry right now is spending about $200 billion this decade in reducing emissions through improved internal combustion engines, um, hybrid transmissions, new transmissions, and that kind of thing. Cause, and that goes to our core business, which will be our core business for a, a period of time, but also investing a lot in electric vehicles. So in Canada, we launched the Chevrolet Volt uh, back in 2010. Um, you may or may not know that was the first electric car with a lithium-ion battery in it, and that was only in 2010. And uh, we launched the next generation of that just this year, earlier in the year. Um, in a, a period of low oil prices, we're worried, well, are people still going to be interested in electric cars? And uh, we're relieved to know and proud to say that we're going to sell probably two or three times the number of Chevrolet Volts this year as we did last year, that tells us that um, we're starting to break through some of what we call adoption issues with, uh, with consumers. Recently announced that we'll launch the Chevrolet Bolt EV, which will have 383 uh, kilometers of full electric range. Uh, we'll have those in Canada just in a matter of weeks. So that whole um, electrification sp space is, is moving um, very quickly. And I'll come back in a minute to where the, the opportunity side of that um, Autonomous is getting a lot of airplay today, and as you rightly pointed out, if you brought that up in a conversation a couple years ago, um, I had it described to me as a parlor trick. It's something that you might see at, uh, at Disney World mm -hmm. in five years, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But as we sit here today, we can look and see that we have all of the enabling technologies for autonomous already on the road. Um, features such as uh, lane keeping, which will mm -hmm. follow the lines on the road and keep you in, in your lane, or um, automated emergency braking or adaptive cruise control, on and on and on. So all those enabling technologies we're already seeing in cars on the road today. Um, the connectedness part of it, uh, General Motors has been in that business since 1995 when we launched OnStar as a telematic services. We've had, uh, we call them button pushes. If you've driven a GM car, there's a little blue button on the, the, the rear view mirror that you press, the blue button. We've had over a billion presses of that button since uh, 1995. A billion kind of interactions with consumers and that type of service. We're now extending that into 4G LTE connectivity. We have more of that and we have it in every vehicle line in our company. Um, and uh, the goal of that is um, to support the consumer's desire to live the, the connected life. And the, uh, let's say the later trend coming along here is the shared economy. Uh, Uber is a very well-known story. Mm -hmm. Um, consumers are telling us, particularly certain demographics, that uh, um, they're very switched on to this idea of a shared economy. Um, the idea of owning a vehicle, the average vehicle that a person owns, get used only about 4% of the time. Um, and if you think about that in a city and paying for parking and insurance and access charges and so on, 
maybe not such a brilliant um, economic uh, proposition. So this idea of sharing enters into it. So with all that in mind, we've made some large investments recently, about $400 million in a company called Lyft, uh, which is the number two ride sharing um, service in the United States, coming soon, soon to Canada. We'll let you all know when the, the, the app is available. Um, and then uh, a billion dollars in cruise automation, which is a, a company in, uh, um, in uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco uh, that, that specializes in autonomous vehicles. And both of those are examples of um, doing business differently, looking outside of the company, because we are over 100 years old. Um, and you develop some habits, not all of them good when you're 100 years old. So uh, it's very purposeful to look outside of the company for ways to innovate. Um, and, and get new ideas and accelerate our, our progress. Not to deny them, but to, uh, to embrace them and get there before anyone else. And, and then as we think of um, what does that mean to Canada, the car becomes as much or more about software than it does hardware, as we've noted in the past. And I just reinforce some of what was said a bit earlier here. We produce more STEM graduates, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math in, um, in Ontario than virtually anywhere else in North America. Um, and uh, we have more uh, PhDs in artificial intelligence and machine learning um, just in the yeah. city of Toronto than anywhere else in the world, full stop. And it turns mm -hmm. out, you know, artificial intelligence is the key to autonomous driving. So um, as we went through the ecosystem and started joining the dots, we said there's a real opportunity for Canada here where uh, we could lead the world in some of these specialized areas in the future of the automotive industry. And then it changes how we think about um, participating, whereas you know, our history has been through assembly plants and powertrain plants and in manufacturing, and we're certainly very interested in preserving and growing that. But um, you know, the real opportunity to get engineers you know, working in our e ecosystems with our universities um, working on, on, on technology and projects that can go on not just a couple hundred thousand vehicles, but you know, 10 million vehicles mm -hmm. that we produce and sell all around the world in a, in a, in a global supply chain. So that's, that's where we are, and um, you know, we've been taking steps in that direction here over the past uh, 18 to 24 yeah, months. Yeah, great. Now, I want to move you to a conversation mode among yourself, and I'll get you started. Uh, with one question, but of course uh, you can uh, interact with one another, ask each other a question or comment on each other's answer. And that is, um, I'd like to get you started about competition because you've all talked about the fierce competition that you're facing. And uh, tell us how um, you see some competitive advantages from being in Canada as well as some disadvantages from being in Canada and, and the kind of uh, changes you'd like to see or what we need to keep? I can, yes. I'd be happy to start. I, I think um, one of the things we're really proud of, of participating in and helping build in Canada uh, from a competitive uh, perspective is the clinical trials capability. Uh, over the year, just last year, our companies spent a billion dollars collectively uh, investing in, in research, science, and clinical trial research in Canada. And Canada is now the only country uh, that is considered equivalent to the U.S. Uh, by the FDA. And that is a, a very significant, in our world, that is a very significant achievement. It, is, it speaks to high quality of researchers, high quality of the uh, institutions that the research takes place in, and believe it or not, high, the highest quality patients, most educated, most involved, most engaged mm -hmm. patients in the world. Uh, and we're, what happens with that, though, is it comes at a price. We are also the second most expensive place in the world to do that research. Mm -hmm. And so the competitive side is Canada has established and created this gem of a capability uh, and it, has, it is a, a very expensive capability the industry continues to invest in because of the combination of quality. And frankly, for us, the Canadian dollar where it sits today is the tipping point to bring a surge of uh, increased clinical research back into Canada, and we've been seeing that over the past mm -hmm. couple of years. But the, the core, the infrastructure investment, the investment in higher education, the investment in our medical systems, 
uh, over years and years and years has, has delivered, uh, whether, we, whether we know it or whether we celebrate it or not, a real world-class uh, set of institutions, researchers and scientists, and, and mm -hmm. that for our industry is a huge draw in, here in Canada. Alain, you were born here in Canada. Yeah. I mean, the company <laughs> was born in Canada, and you still have a lot of your operations in Canada. So what I do you see at that? I think that, as I said earlier, I think we're very fortunate to have such a large aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the pluses is the fact that we have, there's, call it a cluster, you know, an ecosystem, or a very large web. Um, I think that's a big plus, because uh, we're not alone. I mean, there's like other players in the industry, which is very critical because it drives a lot of program with universities, colleges. So we have access to phenomenal talent. And it's not just like PhD and, and engineers, but it's also people actually, actually working in our manufacturing and assembly and, and test operations. So the talent, the network, uh, the, some of the investment programs that are accessible, all of this I think is very good. It's the, that, that's clearly the, on the plus side. And the challenge that I think that we're going to have and that we have is like Canada is a small market, uh, 35 million uh, people, and we don't have any defense really industry. I mean, we have very limited you know, defense projects. Uh, whereas when you compete with Airbus and Boeing, um, the U.S. defense budget is over $600 billion a year. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of uh, technology that is being developed on the, on the defense military side and then transfer, transferred to commercial applications. That is very tough to compete with. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing in Europe. Uh, and you have like emerging players uh, like China, Japan, that are actually establishing aerospace as a national priority, uh, meaning that they are significantly investing in aerospace and, and the development of their, uh, of their industry. And why they're doing that is because it's a good industry, because it trades tremendous, tremendous value for the, for the country. So I think that that's the challenge that we are, we're facing moving forward. Um, and I think that there needs to be a reflection as to what do we want moving forward uh, here in Canada in terms of our aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. Is that a core industry? Is, that some, is it an industry that we want to keep growing in Canada? Uh, or it's an industry that we just want to you know, exit over mm -hmm. time? And I'm not saying this lightly. I, I think that I, if the, the, it's not just two major poles here, US and Europe. I mean, the, you've got emerging players here that have very large indigenous markets. Um, so they can basically self-sustain themselves and their growth for years to, uh, to come. So we're going to need to think about, you know, what does it mean for us? What type of national? Uh, programs, mechanism that we need to put in place to maintain that in the long run so that we can compete successfully with large existing players, but also with all these emerging uh, players that are, that are coming to market pretty quickly. Okay. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I, um, I, I think Canada has an incredible opportunity. I think, I think it was Tom that mentioned it this morning. We're, we're a small country. Yeah. And that's an advantage. And we're a small group of people. And I, I gave you a number of examples that we, where we collaborate so well within our industry, cross industry, with environmentalists. Canada has an incredible uh, ability to bring people together. And uh, I'll give you an example My, uh, from Shell, our former C CFO, uh, came to visit us. And I brought him to one of our meetings, uh, and it was with a regulator, it was with the government, it was with industry, and we were all around talking about a specific problem. And he was just blown away, and he said nowhere else in the world could he have gone to a meeting with that open frank trying to solve a challenge. And, uh, and that's why we've been able to do the things we've been doing, like COSIA, like the Alberta Climate mm -hmm. Change Policy. 
I think that uh, with real clarity of purpose and become, wanting to become the most competitive, we could do it. I think the challenge, back again, to is a lot of things that the, the other panels mentioned, is the complexity that we have across the country and the inability to frame decisions and uh, mm. like the regulatory decisions that we yes. have. It's so complex, the rules of the game are not clear, and that's a competitive mm. disadvantage. Incredible, considering that we yes. have such an advantage to be able to convene, to work together on a problem, but we can't solve these bigger, larger, yes. complex problems. And, uh, and until you're, uh, you have an ability to understand the decision frame in which, where you're going, and, uh, and how you get there and make these choices. Until you have a decision frame, you actually can't make the choices, so we're stuck in doing nothing and not making mm -hmm. the choices. Yeah. So that's the disadvantage to Canada, is, is too uh, complex, and we yeah. need to simplify that yeah. in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think a, a clear advantage, and um, the others have said it, Alain said it, but uh, the ecosystem and uh, uh, our experience with uh, the university, we work with about 13 universities mm -hmm. across the country and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, innovation accelerators that we have, Communitech um, mm -hmm. comes to mind. We have a, a presence there and the way that that can bring, mm -hmm. you know, all the constituents together to, in our case, expose ourselves to new ideas, to new talent, to new companies and uh, we've seen that in a very mm -hmm. short period of time. Uh, people that we wouldn't have thought of talking to a year ago or wouldn't have thought of talking to us, but all very relevant to um, a future sort of, uh, of an auto industry. And you can extend it from there into the supply base and other relationships that, that we have. Um, and we've had a very similar experience where we start to talk about, uh, you know, where we can compete with some bigger picture ideas, this idea of multimodal integrated transportation systems. In, in Canada, you can fill a room of people mm -hmm. in a couple of days yeah. to talk about that in a holistic yeah. sense and then you think about could we be the world's best jurisdiction for um, for creating that technology and, and export not unlike what Barjay has done in the past with uh, uh, with uh, transit systems right if we if we think about it that way in a in a bigger picture sense uh, the challenges with it come the competition is that uh, the opportunity is it's, it's, it's white space right now. The whole world is competing. They want to do that job. So there's an urgency there. Um, we're competing against other jurisdictions yeah. that want to do that. Um, because I think the rest of the world sees the opportunity to move into higher value streams of, uh, of value added and engineering and so on. And um, embedded within that challenge, the question we have to ask ourselves, and it's come up in other conferences, do we have the grit? to really go after it and do we have the sense of urgency? Do we feel a kind of existential mm -hmm. threat where we really mobilize quickly enough to take advantage of the opportunity? Yeah. Great. Uh, you've all talked about the talent in our country. You've talked about great institutions. Uh, but this morning we heard many people talk about the importance that we have in getting more of the academic sector, working with the private sector, getting that relationship to a, a different level. So I'm gonna turn you into uh, marriage counselors. So uh, we have a relationship, I think all of you have relationships. So what would, you, what would be the one or two advice you'd give to the other partner so that that relationship would be better? And what would you tell yourself that you need to do to get that relationship to an even better relationship. And I'm asking you, I'm really interested because I know all my colleagues in the universities really want to work on this and improve our relationships. We get it, we understand how important it is, how important it is for Canada, for our, our companies, but also for our students. So we're ready, we're, we're have an open mind on this and we're ready to hear from you. How can we do better on our side and what, can, what do you need to do yourself also to get that relationship to an even better place than we are now? Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's again, it's uh, back to what problem are you trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I look at the universities and, and we have some great universities and a lot of them are solving similar mm -hmm. problems. Yeah. And uh, how, but are they solving the problems that businesses need? Yeah. And my experience has been there's a bit of an arm's length 
mm -hmm. almost uh, to uh, you know the purest mm. research, and really it's about mm -hmm. research for what uh, I don't know who mentioned it. Oh, it was Marty mentioned uh, yeah. solving the problems that the customers need, yeah. and uh, and I think we're we're doing a lot better. I know that we're having discussions in Alberta now with the universities, U of A and U of C, yeah. and the industry a lot more uh, fruitful conversations about, okay, how do we decarbonize our oil? Yeah. That's the problem we need to solve. Yeah. And, uh, and how do we work together as a team? Industry needs that problem solved. Yeah. Uh, universities got the talent there. And, uh, and then how do we bring uh, the yeah. whole ecosystem together? I think uh, Canada is kind of immature on the side of really creating these ecosystems with universities, with yeah. business, et cetera, a, mm -hmm. a true partnership. I think it's been really a unfocused mm -hmm. or lacking clarity of purpose, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, between business and uh, universities. Mm -hmm. Very much you know, partnerships, but not real partnerships yeah. that has that clarity of yeah. focus. Oh, I, I have a very positive experience. I mean, I, I think that mm -hmm. Oh, we, we work with roughly 20 universities you know, mm -hmm. across Canada today. Uh, we have, I don't know, like 50 or so projects on the go at any point, any one point in time. Um, it has been, and it's just not mm -hmm. us, Bombardier, but I, aerospace yeah. industry at large. I remember my days when I was at, at Pride Whitney, that was the same thing. Yeah. We had very strong collaborations uh, with a, a lot of universities. Mm -hmm. So I think on the aerospace side, uh, it's, I would say it's a, it's a good established relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, I think it's mature, but evolving well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a good relationship. So, yeah. uh, we benefit tremendously. Yeah. I mean, they work on very com complex yeah. uh, topics, I, uh, like on aerodynamic design. You know, the yeah. U University of Toronto, fantastic. Yeah. They're very good. Yeah. Uh, we work with like uh, University Polytechnic in Montreal on uh, icing technology. Yeah. I mean, and it, it sounds like not much, but I, when yeah. you fly at 45,000 feet and you start seeing mm -hmm. icing on the wing, you want to make sure that your de-icing system does work. You know? yeah. So I mean, that's it. There are, we, we focus on specific projects and we work well together. Yeah. There was a bit of challenges back then on IP, who would retain yeah. the IP yeah. and could we use the system on other yeah. platforms and you know like uh, could the university university mm -hmm. sell it to somebody else. I think that by and large we've we've passed that yeah. today. I mean there's a little bit still of, of that because yeah. when you every time you work on advanced stuff, advanced technology products, um, it always pop up. I mean the IP protection yeah. is always you know, core and centered, but I would say it's, today it's very good. In my case, just maintain the dialogue, the openness, what the industry needs, sharing it with universities, and also keep on grooming top talent. I yeah. mean, it's like, we, the, our universities recruit some of the best students in the world. So, I mean, yeah. obviously Canadians, but also attract yeah. people from all over the planet. And uh, when it comes, when recruiting time comes, I mean, it's we find uh, mm -hmm. very top-notch people here, and we like it. So yeah. I mean, we're I think that we're very fortunate to have such a great, you know, university network in Canada. Yeah, tell me because I've always uh, been promoting the creation of these very dynamic zones of interactions where there's a much more freer exchange of ideas, technologies. Um, we have those, uh, for instance, in CRIAC, uh, in the aeronautical sector. Has that been a, a, a component to getting you to where you are today? The fact that you have this CRIAC organization that has uh, grown over the time and, and has been able to create that space for, for you? Absolutely. That's the reason why I said in aerospace might yeah. be a little bit different. Yeah. But we've been working with universities for yeah. a long time yes. and all these tough topics have been yeah. you know uh, discussed extensively so that they would not become you know a roadblock yes. in, in, into our relationship uh, between university and industry yeah. so clearly it's a big deal and we're again very fortunate that some company and some leaders take the lead here yeah. and address that so yeah. I, I if there's anything I there's if there's one place that is working extremely yeah. well in my view that is it oh. and we need to do more of it more okay. projects together I mean 
uh, E&D is very expensive. I mean, it's very yeah. costly to develop new products. Yeah. And when you do that in a partnership mode with university, you can actually develop some very specific portion of technology of aircraft you know, in collaboration with university and help you bring your cost yeah. down and get you know, superb results out yeah. of it. I mean, there, we've got a ton of very smart people. Mm -hmm. We need to leverage that. Yeah. Good, good. I'll, uh, I'll reinforce that the IP, um, the IP landscape has shifted and is, yeah. is more favorable for true collaborations. Mm -hmm. I think uh, certainly in our industry, we participate in, in multiple uh, projects across mm -hmm. the universities. I think uh, some sectors in, in healthcare innovation have accelerated a little faster. I think the devices industry, uh, health mm -hmm. tech, um, you know, certainly in Toronto mm -hmm. at Mars, I, I see also in the audience, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it, it really is a shiny beacon and, and an example of entrepreneurs uh, with the right kind of support and a favorable uh, environment for their ideas to, to flourish uh, can really be making a difference. It's, I'll, I'll just comment, I've, I've been in Canada and the United States over the last 20 years, uh, but I am yeah. originally uh, from Montreal. And, uh, and, and, and love what we've created here in our public health and our public university systems. But the fact, you know, what is our greatest strength, which is mm -hmm. the, a, a wide access to both uh, healthcare and to education, mm -hmm. is also a potential weakness of our university yeah. system because uh, mm -hmm. our kids don't grow up thinking that they're going to be the challenging entrepreneurs and have yeah. the big, winning idea um, and our scientists you know in spite of the fact i have this debate regularly with the president of the university of toronto that are the scientists ready to go and sell their ideas yeah. um, i i do see a whole different cultural uh, mindset yes. here than i than i have experienced in the united states and in mm -hmm. my travels to the uk yes. and germany and, and other places where mm -hmm. the participation where where scientists themselves are starting mm -hmm. to say you know, we can create, for, for, the, for a molecule that is developed and commercialized yeah. in Canada, there are 28 in the United States, you know, yes. and yet there's only 10 times the population. So there's something there yes. that I think in our university systems and, uh, yes. and, and in our other public institutions, mm -hmm. we should sit there and go, if we really want innovation, mm -hmm then we, um, we can be more welcoming to industry yeah. and, and we uh, can uh, actually say what does colla true collaboration look like. Both yeah. sides have to give a little, yeah. but I think both sides want to give a little. Yeah, and I totally agree with you on this, that, that we're not at all where we need to be. And I'll make one observation, and that is from my own university. Uh, we've increased our investment in partnerships and innovation. We've recruited a top person to lead us. But we know that we don't have the resources to invest at the level we should, because this is about partnerships. It's about creating a partnership. It's about nurturing a partnership. And you need people on the ground. And we simply don't have the resources to do it. I mean, we cannot justify, I won't go on and on, but we can't justify taking tuition fees from our students because the return is largely on society, not directly to our uh, students and so there's a limit to how much we can invest we'd all love to invest more but we don't have any places really to find those resources it's a real challenge and it's true in all of our universities in canada so the u.s are better equipped on that front to invest in and that nurturing creating and nurturing of relationship which we can't uh, so well, let me be a little provocative here and say yeah. that maybe what we should be thinking about is less the preserving the purity of the pub fully public system and start looking at uh, collaborations that are more or even uh, extensions of our of our public health and university yeah. system that look more like private institutions. It's just a provocative question. Yeah. <laughs> we should ask what the barriers are and why we feel constrained from doing this and what we would lose uh, by, by testing ourselves in some of these areas yeah. versus what we might gain as a global competitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephen. Well, I think in terms of what the industry needs to do, um, we need to, it, we're in such a transition and it's so disruptive is, uh, get the narrative out there in terms of what the auto sector can look like and uh, we're that's a work in process mm -hmm. and we're busy visiting schools we I got around to I've been back to Canada for about 18 months and yeah. got around to 13 schools last ac academic year and we're mm -hmm. just starting up 
Um, again, uh, this year we'll get down to Quebec, for yeah. instance. <laughs> Um, so to get that story out there and to get the problem statements yeah. out there to, to the point of what's the customer want, we put the consumer at the, at yeah. the middle, what problems are we, are we trying to solve? And then um, as pertains to the collaboration, I'll, I'll go back to an idea I think uh, Minister Baines referenced this morning. I, I really do think we need to pick some lanes, so to speak, and to, to pick some focus areas, some, some sectors or some technology areas mm -hmm. because... Uh, that applies equally to clusters. I think we can't afford to do it all. We have to pick some spots, and uh, and specialize and really be excellent at them. Because as we get around, there's some you know really terrific research going on, yeah. um, kind of in pockets. We could do a better job at connecting the dots. You know, working between mm -hmm. industry and uh, yeah. and with the universities. And the other idea that um, really resonate resonates with me is this kind of crossover between public and private I yes. ideas like. Um, DARPA or Fraunhofer or something like that, yeah. some middle ground where we can um, really do some deep thought and, and integration to bring these I ideas to, to life. I think that's uh, uh, something we really need to think about. Yeah. Great. I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. As you know, there are three uh, microphones uh, around the room. And so if you can uh, use one of them to ask questions to the panel, that would be uh, appreciated. So I'm not seeing people rushing to, oh, <laughs> you're going to be first. Go first. for it. So um, we have two elements of the transportation realm on the panel, the upstream side um, with Lorraine's World and then the end user with yourself, Stephen. So what guidance would you give to the oil and gas industry around its future? <laughs> Diversify? <laughs> No, I, I think uh, what we're, you know, this is a, a journey that we're on. It's going to take a number of years to address all these um, issues that we've um, set out. So, um, you know, we're all in the CO2. We're all in the greenhouse gas reduction um, situation together in Canada. So I think it's incumbent on every sector to continue to um, address those challenges in the most pro pro proactive and, uh, and productive way. So, um, you know, if, if, if we don't get it done in, uh, in, uh, um, in hydrocarbons, then we'll get it done in automotive. Like we, the imperative is we have to take on that challenge and reduce uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So I would, I'm very encouraged by, you know, what has mm -hmm. been talked about here today. So I, I would only encourage that to, to, to keep going. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that, uh, Judy. It's... Um, I want to add to what you just mentioned, Stephen, on uh, the, uh, the narrative and the vision and the focus. I, I, I look at uh, what are we good at and, uh, and what are we going to spend our money in it. And in business, we talk a lot about opportunity costs. And so when I think about our market access that we have not, not gotten for a long time, you know, in the last decade, we have just uh, given the U.S. basically $100 billion dollars. Hundred billion dollars in the discount factor that we sell our product at. So I'd like to have that hundred billion dollars back, mm -hmm. so I can reinvest and maximize the value of our resource. Throw that hundred billion dollars into research that would actually start to decarbonize our uh, our product. So we would maximize the value of our product now, and then start competing globally. I mean, that's about the efficiency of the money that we spend and the focus and, and have a narrative about how do our natural resources, our family business, actually fit into the future. And back to autonomous vehicles. Well, we actually have a manufacturing business in the oil sands. It's a manufacturing business. Autonomous vehicles are going to be used there, a lot of robotics, yeah. all of these things. How do you bring that together to start to think about how do we maximize the efficiency of our businesses within Canada? and use that to actually start exporting. Because we're a small country, yeah. we got a lot, but if we focus, we can actually turn these businesses into global businesses that are for the future. Okay. If you think about where the pressures are gonna come, if CO2 reduction is the decarbonizing yeah. is the name of the game, um, typically electricity generation is a huge component of that. If, if you look around the world, um, we've already made mm -hmm significant investments if you think about British Columbia and Ontario and Quebec in terms of shifting mm -hmm. to hydroelectricity and uh, and uh, and nuclear 
we have a lot less CO2 to work on in electricity generation than other jurisdictions. So you could argue they'll go there first. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, to get off of coal. So we have a, um, when we look at it, what, what do we have to work on? We have to work on transportation. We have to work on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on uh, oil. So uh, necessity being the mother of invention, mm -hmm. if we embrace that opportunity, we can get ahead of the world and export that technology, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. to the moderator so um oh, yes. it's me <laughs> yeah oh all right that, okay <laughs> and you can, may choose to uh, have the panel to intervene as well after uh, my question is uh, hearing the uh, minister bain this morning claiming that uh, they will more likely be selecting maybe four to five specific cluster in canada this will probably bring uh, towards a national consensus because some cluster may lose or win. Uh, I'm just curious to know if your committee and also if uh, there's any suggestion from the panel as uh, what could be the framework to build that consensus? Yes, well, I'll, I'll start uh, and then I'll let the panel. What I heard the minister say is that the selection of clusters would be done through a competitive process and a series of objectives or questions that uh, people would uh, address and, and sell their own sector or their own uh, um, initiative as one of those that should be selected. And I think my experience certainly, because I, you know, I, I used to be in uh, the business of running competitions when I was the president of ANSERC, uh, my sense was always that uh, when there is a, a good, fair uh, competition with clear objectives and clear criteria, consensus is a lot easier to achieve than uh, when people are not too sure who can get in the game and who can compete when it's very open and people compete. And I, I must say in my sector, uh, we've had just uh, that experience, and I think the minister talked about it. Some very important investments have been made in what is called the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And I was actually very impressed to see how naturally some areas that are very, very strategic for Canada came to the fore through a very competitive process. So we have some winning projects on energy, in the ocean, health sector, stem cell, uh, the brain, uh, non, uh, the uh, um, quantum uh, information, and so on. They came quite naturally to the fore through a competitive process. If you'd ask a group of, uh, of smart people to choose, they might have come to those same uh, topics, I, I should have mentioned also AI and big data, they might have converged towards those topics, but the fact that it came in a natural, competitive, transparent process meant that consensus, I think, was a lot easier to achieve and, and the results to be accepted as good results because we were all competing under the same uh, framework and under the same rules. But I'll ask you to uh, add your own thoughts here. Yeah, I, uh, I would hope that this process actually has a very clear uh, vision of where we want to position Canada in the future and what's the frame in which we can make these decisions. If it's just an open uh, competition, I fear no. that it will not be strategic enough. And uh, so I keep going back to what, what are some of our foundational pillars of our economy, and I think you can put these on your hand, and then what would be the enablers across that. And I would have thought that the clusters would be the foundation and the enablers would be you know, within these clusters. Yep. And uh, so I, I'm hoping, um, I was quite intrigued by listening to the four or five, and when we think about six, uh, six sectors, I, I think it needs to talk about what is the foundation of, what's the foundational pillars of the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. The way I would approach it is you know, looking at the auto sector, we've been an integral part of the manufacturing economy in Canada for decades. And so the question that's out there is what's the future of the auto sector? And so the way I would approach this is, well, if we accept some of what I talked about before, which is the world and the future is um, a multimodal, connected, autonomous, shared, electric 
um, sort of personal mobility system, I'd say, well, um, that sounds like a, a good opportunity. Um, can we put a consortium together that might execute that project? And would that be a candidate um, mm -hmm. to help us flesh out and define the future of the auto sector? So using autos as, a, as an example, and then that would have to stand the test of you know, what mm -hmm. other, whatever other competitors are in the, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think it works for autos because um, it's not business as usual. Whatever we do um, going down the road is going to be cross-sector. It's going to be auto as we know it, but it's going to be it's going to be network. It's going to be infrastructure, and I think it would give us uh, an opportunity to challenge um, what Amanda said just before. Is I think infrastructure can be really sexy mm -hmm. if we think about it as being um, connected and electric and, and shared. We can turn it into something that's really unique in the world yeah. and. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into what the minister said, but I get kind of excited by it if we could mm -hmm. um, have that mechanism to put those ideas out there and really debate them and set the priorities and allocate the resources to them. I think we could do something really exceptional. Okay. Yes, please. Hello. My name is Paul Lansburg and I'm with the Forest Products Association of Canada. And I can, I can relate to all of your panelists. Uh, our <laughs> industry has gone through uh, the environmental challenges uh, years ago. We've gone through uh, facing new competition with new entrants. Uh, we've gone through some structural challenges with the digitization of uh, some of our markets. So, you know, newsprint, uh, not that many people read the physical paper anymore. And so what we've been trying to do is work with the government and, and previous governments um, about uh, policies and programs to help the industry transform, innovate, um, and, and really in a pre-competitive space. And so CASIA, I think, is mm -hmm. a, a comparative. And I'm just wondering, you know, given where the government is talking about now, whether it be the innovation agenda and the clusters that you were just discussing, or the Clean Resources Initiative under Minister Carr, uh, are you seeing the policy discussion going in the right direction uh, giving a good balance between helping the technology developers and the more mature or established firms that want to adopt those uh, clean tech. Any, any comments? Yeah, so uh, I think we've got the bones of it in, uh, in our industry with COSIA, forming COSIA. I think uh, the first policy that came out, of course, last week was actually getting a carbon price. I think a carbon price is one tool in the uh, toolkit. But I think the next stage, I would hope that one of these clusters will be energy. And I think as an enabler, it, it is clean tech. And I think the biggest enabler uh, for our business is, first of all, to maximize the value of our existing product, which is to get market access. And that allows us to actually play in this game. Uh, because if we don't have market access, we will never get a capital mm. to flow into our business and, and actually be allowed to play in the game in the first place. So I think that we've got, we're have we starting to get the ingredients. I think the climate policy that the government just put in place is good. The next thing is really getting market access. And after that, it's really about creating these clusters for innovation, which will make a cleaner and uh, uh, cheaper or more cost-effective product which can compete globally. I mean, that is truly what we're trying to create in our industry. Yeah. Can I make a, I, I'd like to, to build a little bit on the cluster and the question of policies. I mean, it's, uh, we've, I personally have been engaged in, in work on a cluster in Toronto around health and human sciences. And, and interestingly enough, a cluster, is, as we've understood it, and I think as Minister Baines may also mean, is the, uh, the juxtaposition of people opportunity, mm -hmm. capital, uh, ideas, and, uh, and infrastructure to some degree. And so um, I've, I've thought of clusters as, as geographically centered as well as, as industry or sector centered. And uh, you know, there are definitely capabilities and concentrations of, of key infrastructure, capital, and people that exist. And I think one of the biggest issues that we continue to talk about is scaling talent so it's not enough just to have uh, early stage uh, producers of ideas and, and uh, businesses in these clusters, but they have to be able to scale to, uh, to an exportable level. And the other idea is that we need to be attractive to international capital if we want to continue to mm -hmm. develop growth and to have these, again, globally competitive uh, companies. 
growing out of these clusters. Uh, it's not enough just to have infrastructure in place. It's not enough to have great universities and, and institutions. And in our case, fantastic um, health delivery systems. You have to be attractive. You have to compete for that global capital yeah. and investment. And, and interestingly enough, it is as bizarre as uh, having investors from Boston come to Toronto and have to go back to Boston through an international terminal uh, that if they don't have Nexus cards, they have to line up behind everybody coming in from all over the world. Strange, but true. So there are, there are, there are big things, and there are also little things that be, we could be working on to sustain and build uh, these potential clusters. I hope it is a competitive uh, game. I think that we should also understand, though, that we have some amazing uh, bases that have, are already existing, and, and they are preferentially positioned to be winners in this, in this contest. And that's okay, because that's how the world works. The capabilities should yeah. win. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking to see if there are other questions. I don't think I see any. It's a bit hard with the light to see. So if you're standing there and I'm not seeing you, please scream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, I, I, we're just about to wrap up uh, the panel. And um, I, I just want to ask you one last question. Whoever wants to jump in this one should. Uh, we've been talking increasingly around the world about inclusive growth. And of course, we know that uh, there will be a need for uh, leadership in government for inclusive growth. But I don't think it will happen if it's just government. Inclusive growth is something that we all have to uh, take ownership of. So how do you see that inclusive growth within your company? What is the role of your company in promoting inclusive growth? Yes. So I, I don't have a company. I represent companies yeah. uh, here at the table. You know, I think we looked at, uh, we can look at an example like J-Labs in Toronto, which yes. gets talked about a lot, but it's really important to keep reinforcing because it is a huge, huge investment. Uh, and the only, the first investment by uh, Johnson & Johnson outside of the United States where they are literally yeah. an incubator of incubators, so small companies can start up and get infrastructure and be helped. I think encouraging more of those, but, yeah. but the, the tricky bit in Canada, again, I, I spoke to public institutions and, and how we treasure and preserve them. You know, there is, innovation needs to find a home. Once yeah. it is invented, it needs to be purchased. Mm -hmm. It needs to be sustained yeah. in the economy. Canada is a small market, but it's an mm -hmm. important market to new innovators and to people who are inventing things in Canada. And we need to protect them. We need to be the first purchasers of their products. Mm -hmm. and, and companies will invest more and more in helping to grow these, these companies when they are, are, see that there are receptive markets and receptive purchasing policies. And it's just, it seems like a very simple thing, yeah. but, but there is a willingness and an interest to invest and to continue to grow things. Um, and we're most interested in saying, what are the barriers that should be broken down and how do we break them down together? It is, that's a, another area of collaboration. So mm -hmm. our industry okay. wants to give more into that space yes. and we want to see the rewards to mm -hmm. ourselves and to the companies we help start. Yeah. Okay. Alain? Oh, clearly. You have the last word. No, I, 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 I mean, I think this is a tough question. The fact yeah. is that, I mean, there's multiple dim dimensions to, uh, to yeah. this. Uh, how you do that, I mean, obviously, it starts with the innovation. But if you look at our industry, I mean, like I mentioned, I was saying earlier, there's steady, solid growth, you know, yeah. for years to, to come. Is How do you enable that, yeah. you know, from Canada? Yeah. We are a global player today. We do sell all, uh, all over the world. Um, it's interesting because you get to a point where it's not just competing company to company now. Yeah. We get into a zone where the bilateral relationship, mm -hmm. country to country, do make a difference. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about enabling growth, it's, it, in, in, in some cases, it goes beyond just competing on a project or competing on a platform. It also can be government to government. Mm -hmm. And we see that more and more in aerospace. Mm -hmm. You know, Europe with China, mm -hmm. Germany with China. Um, and we see that a lot on the train side, a lot. Because, I mean, many of these projects are infrastructure related. Uh, they're they're uh, city projects. They're government-owned uh, or driven projects. So when you talked about inclusive growth, like, I was saying it's entire 
from the A to Z. I mean, the entire food chain is, mm. is, is part of this. Uh, and you need to look at how you drive it from having the best technology, the best products, the highest quality, at the lowest possible cost, so that you can compete successfully in the, mar mar in the marketplace. But as well, is there additional lever levers that you can use? And as I was saying, bilateral relationship mm -hmm. from country to country, in our case, can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's more than just one um, answer to that question. Okay. Yeah, and it's a similar perspective in the way that I would see it. I, I, think, uh, I think you actually can't grow anymore without inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. And when I think about our sector, and I gave the example of, uh, I mean, dealing with the First Nations yes. challenge that we have in uh, Canada is the linchpin to our resource industry mm -hmm. being able to grow. Yes. And, uh, and unless we can actually uh, work cross and mm -hmm. de develop more sustainable communities mm -hmm. that could grow, as I said, the opportunity to grow mm -hmm. uh, globally, we are not going to yeah. be able to develop. And, and I think the other thing which we brought up earlier, as our industry is reinventing ourselves, we're going to also, as an industry, have to work across uh, sectors. And I think we are going to have yeah. to work. We have, a, as I said, we're a small country. We have an incredible opportunity here to work across with the yeah. transportation industry and start mm -hmm. thinking about our manufacturing, even though people don't think of our extraction business as manufacturing, mm -hmm. it is, but working with other manufacturers, working with the transport industry, so, and then working with governments. I don't think each one of our industries can really grow without uh, yeah. doing that inclusive growth. I think that is the 21st century way to okay. grow. Okay, so we'll end with that because we're in the 21st century. Merci because beaucoup, it's please. <laughs> yes, yeah, 2016. Please help me in thanking our panel for this great discussion. <laughs>